very distinguished guests, we are honored to welcome you to the opening of the 2020-21 Academic Year of Sabancı University and welcoming of the 2020-21 Mercator IPC Fellows with Honorary Speaker, Mercator IPC Visiting Senior Fellow, Pankaj Mishra. Globally, we live in extremely difficult times due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Before our event, we were completed our disinfection process and also in the semi-open area of the, this seat museum. At Sabancı University, we deeply acknowledge the difficulties that our students, faculty members, and staffs are facing. We believe that we tackle these challenges together through building solidarity. On this note, we are gl very glad to have you here in person and online for the opening of the 2020-21 Academic Year of Sabancı University. Now I would like to invite the President of Sabancı University, Yusuf Leblebici, for his welcoming remarks to the stage. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, dear guests, dear students, our faculty members, dear chairman of our board, Esküler Sabanje, dear members of the board, I would like to welcome you all to this very special event today uh, taking place at the Sakop Sabanje Museum in Emirgan and organized by the Istanbul Policy Center. We have a very prominent guest with us today, Mr. Pankaj Mishra, uh, who will be speaking to us shortly. I would also like to welcome the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, Mr. Johannes Regenbrecht. As Sabanji University, we are marking the beginning of our fall semester and of course the new academic year 2020-2021 under very extraordinary circumstances. As many of you know very well, our university has successfully completed the past spring semester and also the subsequent summer term with completely online education. Now we are starting the fall semester also with online education in order to preserve the health and safety of our students and of course our faculty members and our staff. During this period, we have been reminded of the importance of solidarity and trust among members of our community. In the face of uncertainty, especially in these trying times, our philosophy expressed in the motto of our school, creating and developing together, has never been more meaningful. These past few months, uh, with the entire world trying to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic, has also shown us the potential shortcomings of the international system and the limitations of scientific progress against an unknown common enemy. We have witnessed, and we are still witnessing, the most highly developed nations on earth struggling against the pandemic. We are observing that fear, discomfort, and resentment are widespread among populations in almost all Western countries. The COVID-19 crisis seems to have amplified some of the very troubling issues, even in the wealthiest countries in the world. Our guest speaker today, Mr. Mishra, is addressing some of these issues with a fresh outlook on history as well as on contemporary events and provides a new insight on how we interpret the world at this chaotic time. We are thankful that he accepted our invitation and to come to Istanbul and we are delighted to have him today as our speaker. I wish you all a wonderful evening with our guest speaker and a successful new academic year.
We extend our sincere thanks to Mr. Yusuf Leblebici. 2020 marks the ninth year of the partnership between Istanbul Policy Center, Sabancı University, and Stiftung Mercator. We are also delighted to have our partners and colleagues tonight that we were with during these past nine years. Now I would like to invite IPC Director Fuat Kehman to the stage. Distinguished colleagues, esteemed guests, dear friends, and dear uh, students. Nine years ago, Istanbul Policy Center of Sabancı University and Stiftung Mercator established a partnership and initiative. In this initiative, uh, we aim to bring together uh, scholars, civil society members uh, to Istanbul from Germany, Europe, and, and Turkey to work together to bring effective knowledge-based, evidence-based policy recommendations with which we could deal with, effectively, deal with the unprecedented global challenges from migration to foreign policy, from economy to health and education integration, so on and so forth. So far, IPC Mercator Initiative has been successful. Throughout those nine years, our vision is to promote first an academic rigor because we need evidence-based information and knowledge-based policy recommendation. We also wanted to be creative. We also wanted to produce a relevant research for, 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 for uh, uh, globalization and for dealing with the, 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 the unprecedented challenges of, 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 of our global world. We wanted uh, to create an environment where scholars have a teamwork. In doing so, we also become friends uh, to produce a friendly environment. I am very happy to, to see our initiative to be very successful in all grounds. We are very academically rigorous. We have been creative. We have produced a relevant world, teamwork, and a friendly environment. In doing so, throughout the nine years, we have hosted in Istanbul, in Sabancı University and Istanbul Police Center, 54 fellows, 18 senior fellows. We have organized more than 300 events in Turkey and abroad, in the key capital of, of, of Europe and, and, and United States. We have cooperated, I'm very, very happy about this, we have cooperated with over 30 national and international institutions, think tanks and, and, and universities. We have, create, we have produced 120 publications in the form of op-eds, policy papers, and academic, academic articles. In 2015, we have, <coughs> we have started embark on our alumni network. Since 2015, IPC Mercator Partnership have produced an ecosystem where every year our alumni and new fellows get together and, and, and talk about the, 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 the problems of our, our world. In doing so, we have focused on first Turkey-EU-Germany relations and also climate change. These relations are very important. We actually value the Turkey's anchor with the West, anchor with the Europe and, 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 and the world. But in do doing so, in, in a creative work, we focus on uh, climate change, economy, renewable energy, energy, education, integration, and all of these issues. We like to modernize custom union. We like to enhance relations between Turkey and, 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 and European, European, European Union. In our uh, senior fellowship program, last couple of years, we have embarked on a new form in which uh, we invite uh, important uh, <coughs> scholars to IPC Mercator Initiative as a guest uh, senior, uh, senior fellow. This year, I'm very glad uh, and i like to thank uh, <coughs> Pankaj Mishra for accepting our offer and Pankaj Mishra has become our visiting senior, senior, senior fellow. 
We are going through a very difficult times with COVID-19. It is not very, very easy to be a student in these times. It is not very easy to be a scholar in these times. It is not easy to produce a creative work in this time. So in this sense, uh, we, Sabancı University and Istanbul Police Center together and Çıptı Mercator organized two event to welcome our students, welcome to our uh, new academics uh, and, and institutions together so that actually we start a communication, we start a new, new dialogue, which is very, very important to tackle with these very, very difficult, difficult times. For that, uh, I will <coughs> finish my, my talk and thank Pakraj Mishra, Pankaj Mishra again. But before uh, passing the floor to Michael Schwartz, my friend and, 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 and colleague, I'd like to thank uh, certain people. I would like to thank my colleagues Rudiger Fromm and Michael Schwartz and Yannis Tesman from Stiftung Mercator for being good friends and, and, and colleagues. I like to thank, starting with Mr. <coughs> Güler Sabancı Hanım, Yusuf Leblebici, our, our, our president, and Kemal Dervish, uh, our uh, senior advisor, to contribute to, to, to actually making this, uh, this, uh, this initiative uh, successful. I like to thank Senem Aydın Dizgit uh, to help me to actually continue this, 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 this end, end, endeavor. Pelin Oğuz, program coordinator of the fellowship, fellowship, has been very successful. Gülcihan Çiğdem, program associate, has been very successful. They worked very hard to put this actually event, event, event together. My IPC team, Meryem Köseoğlu, Canna Tülüs, Ayşe Köse, <coughs> Megan Giskin, Inci Ünal, Mirka Mutlu, and Özgül Kızılda work very hard in this, in these, in these, in these times. Uh, I would like to thank all of them to make these things, uh, these things possible. Now I would like to give the floor to Executive Director of Stiftung Mercator, Michael Schwerz, my, my dear, dear, dear friend, to uh, <coughs> share uh, his opinion with, with us from uh, SN uh, Germany. We are connecting Michael Schmortz through online uh, Zoom program. So sorry for keeping you waiting for this transaction time. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, he is in Essen, in Stiftung Mercator headquarters. And thanks to his and his team, we are continuing our partnership since 2011. And as Fuat Bey mentioned, Mr. Kema mentioned, it's a really fruitful partnership until today. Our team is working on technical matters right now. After that, we will have um, our senior scholars, Senem Aydın Düzgit and Mr. Pankaj Mishra to the stage for his uh, interview and speech. Until this time, you can also write your questions through chat. Please uh, feel free to write your questions through chat. Ms. Uh, Aydın Düzgit will check them out. It's a really quick note.
As I mentioned before, we are, con we are having uh, 25 people in person today, and we are really uh, interested in keeping uh, everyone safe through, through COVID-19 precautions. Today, we, ha we are having 10 people in the room. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Schwartz is ready. He will be joining us. Thank you for your patience. Yes. Mr. Schwartz, please start. Thank you. I am so sorry that I am standing next to me and am far seized by myself when I take the last and I don't see much of my dear colleagues. Because I wonder if the use of energy is too much to the colleagues here. The continued interest in joint research and policy work between Europe and Turkey and the excellent output it has produced over the years speak for itself as a truly unique example of Turkey-European collaboration. Our engagement in Turkey started during a period of departure and optimism. The importance of social, political, economic relations between Turkey and Europe became undeniable and the opening of accession negotiations between Turkey and the EU seemed to provide a solid framework for rapprochement and collaboration. At the time, we have committed ourselves to further strengthen, strengthen the social ties between our societies by facilitating dialogue and exchanges. We bring people from our countries together to break down prejudice and to lay the foundations for joint actions. This includes students and academics, as well as young professionals and journalists, parliamentarians and high school students. But not only in EU-Turkey relations, we had to experience a backsliding. We are observing a radical change in many areas and old certainties begin to fade. What can we do about dangerous climate change? How do we create inclusivity and social cohesion in our societies? How do we cope with digital technologies? How can our democracy survive? In Europe and elsewhere, nationalism and populism are on the rise and put pressure on multilateral institutions. In many countries, civic spaces are under pressure and cross-border collaborations have become subject to suspicion and accusations. The continued detention of our friend and partner, Osman Kavala in Turkey, is a worrying example of this. These developments resonate strongly with the predictions of our keynote speaker, Pankaj Mijra. In his book, The Age of Anger, he observes a global turn to authoritarianism and toxic forms of chauvinism, in which the old West-dominated world is giving away to an apparent global disorder. So this is clearly a moment of crisis, but it is also a creative moment. Today, the famous sociologist Nilifa Göller said in a meeting we had with her, democracy is a learning process. So, Let's learn together. 
Dear friends, we are glad that we have found such friends and partners at Sabanje University. Thank you, Bila Sabanje. Thank you, Fuad. Thank you, Sen, and, and all the team for your important work and our joint program. And similarly, I want to thank our new fellows. During your fellowship, you will explore areas that are crucial, uh, crucial of, of crucial importance to Turkey as well as to Germany and the EU. By doing so, you will undoubtedly con contribute to a better understanding between our societies. And I believe this is highly needed. I am very much looking forward to our future endeavors. Thank you all. We extend our sincere thanks to Mr. Schwartz. Now I would like to invite our senior scholar, Senem Aydın Düzgit, to the stage for her welcoming remarks for our honorary speaker, Pankaj Mishra. We're very honored and privileged to have with us today Mr. Pankaj Mishra as our honorary speaker and as a visiting senior Mercator IPC fellow. Pankaj Mishra is an Indian writer, an essayist, a novelist, who has written extensively on the problems of democracy and liberalism, particularly from a historical perspective. He's the author of several award-winning books, including, among several others, The Romantics, Temptations of the West, from the Ruins of Empire, The Revolt Against the West and the Remaking of Asia, The Age of Anger, A History of the Present, and his most recent book, Bland Fanatics, Liberals, Race and Empire. Mishra writes literary and political essays for the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, The Guardian, The New Yorker, London Review of Books, among other American, British and Indian publications. In 2009, he was nominated a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, and in 2014, he received Yale University's Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome to the stage Mr. Pankaj Mishra. Thank you very much, Senem, for that kind introduction. And thank you all um, distinguished guests and also people who are watching this on the internet for being here, um, both physically and, and, and virtually. I'm very delighted to be here back in Istanbul, one of my favorite cities, and also you know, to be with such, uh, in such congenial company. And I look forward to more discussions uh, tomorrow about the things that the previous speakers referred to and that are all um, at this point not just abstract intellectual concerns but very much things that we are struggling with on a daily basis especially with the arrival of the um, pandemic. About four years ago in um, a little less than four years ago I published a book titled Age of Anger um, which talked about this extraordinary global explosion of um, demagogic authoritarian movements, personalities, often um, figures actually elected by large majorities. And the book came out in 2017, January, the same month that Donald Trump became the President of the United States. But I actually started writing it, or at least thinking about it, making notes back in 2014. And what prompted me to write that book or to think about it was the election in India of Narendra Modi, who was in many ways the uh, original of the many autocrats that we see around the world today. Um, 
It was a great shock to many of us when he won the um, election in, uh, in, in, in 2014 because this is a man who had been implicated quite convincingly in the mass murder of uh, more than a thousand Muslims in the state of Gujarat, of which he was chief minister back in 2002. And most of us really thought of him as a um, extraordinary demagogue, if not someone guilty of mass murder. Uh, but anyway, uh, he came to power in 2014 after a long campaign that was backed by uh, some of India's richest people, some of India's most powerful people. And what had really happened, to give you a very short summary, was that many of the promises that were made originally by India's first um, post-colonial leaders of progress, of development, of national modernization, those promises over time had proven to be, at least for, for a large uh, majority of the population, those promises had proven to be false, if not deceptive. The f country's elites uh, in the past, secular elites, very well-educated elites, had very scantily delivered on their founding promising promises of democracy, development. And then, you know, in the last 20 years, there's a new promise, which is prosperity for all. Uh, with globalization, we are all going to be prosperous. Um, and if only we regulate, privatize, deregulate and privatize, um, embrace the principles of the market, move away from the old format of the uh, uh, mixed economy, become more, more and more uh, like the market economies of uh, Western Europe and the United States, we are going to have faster economic growth and more prosperity. That promise also started to fail or look deceptive in the early 2010s when Narendra Modi started to surge suddenly. S what had happened really to bring him to power was the perception that um, the ruling elite had failed. Instead of equitable growth, we had seen massive concentrations of wealth and inequality. And then you have this failed experiment in uh, economic liberalism or neoliberalism which had benefited only a tiny minority and created this huge reservoir of frustration and resentment. This is classically the opening for any kind of fascistic or semi-fascistic movement. Whenever there is a whole lot of um, promises made, and we saw this first in Germany and Italy, by ruling classes, um, the promise of modernization, of national modernization, and then when you fail, there is an opening there for the far right. And in India, this happened in 2014. And it was very clear what Modi was trying to do, which was to rebuild a, a, a kind of weakened state ideology of nationalism, a new program altogether with new idols, new histories, new values, uh, historical myths, new symbols, uh, often derived from uh, a Hindu supposedly Hindu history, supposedly Hindu past. And in this venture, in this project, uh, he achieved extraordinary success. I mean, I think there's no um, uh, denying that fact, that he was uh, triumphant, almost as well as, you know, the Italian fascists who took over Italy's failed modernization project. Um, what has happened in the last six years in India is that the state has reasserted its sovereignty. It was seen as a weak state, and the state is now sovereign again through the exercise of violence. Violence not just exercised by the state, but also violence that is outsourced to society at large. This is an interesting development. So society, large numbers of people in society have been made participants in the power that only the state used to have, which was the power to inflict violence. So lynch mobs now have the power of life and death. People on social media, trolls, uh, they are encouraged to go after, by the state, by the government, by the ruling party, to go after minorities, 
and liberal elites. So this state-directed force or barbarism, I think is a better word, is really a formidable, extraordinary new power in a country that is overwhelmingly young. It's full of angry, frustrated young men. And then, of course, there is technology. So with, with, with Silicon Valley's innovations, uh, this force has blown away all previous ethical, political standards. So as I said, I mean, Modi has come as a shock to many of us, but I should say that he did not really come as a huge shock to me. This was not only because intellectually you could trace his intellectual pedigree in the fascist movements of the 1920s or 30s, but there was something else. Uh, for someone of my background, uh, which is kind of dispossessed, upper caste, Brahmin gentry, which has always had very natural affinities to far-right reactionary politics, Modi was someone very intimate. I felt like I had known him all my life. Thomas Mann, the German writer, has a wonderful essay on Hitler called this man is my brother. And he calls him a brother who has a great desire for revenge, who's possessed of bottomless resentment, and these are his words, who rouses the population with images of his own insulted grandeur, deafens with promises, makes out of people's sufferings a vehicle for his own greatness, but who is nevertheless a brother a rather unpleasant and mortifying brother, but a brother nevertheless. When I thought of Modi, uh, I felt the same about him I, 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 in the sense that I had lived with people like him all my life with my kind of background. And I also could recognize part of that resentment and part of that pathology that Mann identified in myself as well. So this notion, like, what does it mean to be resentful of other uh, people, of people who have more money, who have more power? This was not you know, an abstract or a remote question for me, because I belong to the group of people who believe themselves to be under threat from all quarters. From on one side, you had the secular elite, the westernized elite, and then you had the low caste Hindus coming from below who were asserting themselves. And so at school and college, I was encountering people um, with you know, these resentments and frustrations and feelings of personal inadequacy, much, much greater, much, much more politically volatile than anything I felt. So with this kind of background, in this book, I was interested in exploring not so much a history of ideas, you know, those are being written all the time by people much more qualified than myself, by academics and scholars. I was drawn more to exploring the climate of ideas, sort of, as I, as I wrote in the book, a structure of feeling and a kind of cognitive disposition. There is, you know, a lot of lis literature out there on nationalism, it's been theorized a lot um, but what I was really interested in understanding is how does ethnic, racial, religious nationalism exercise this emotional power over so many people? And Modi's election in 2014, and then of course he's been re-elected, that is what sort of started making me think about this. Like, what is this spell of nationalism on not just you know ordinary people, not particularly well-educated, but also on writers and intellectuals. And I became very interested in how certain states of minds uh, you could see in different parts of the world and how they were contagious, how certain ideas that emerged from these states of mind became very contagious. And I mean, the book, the, one of the figures that are, that, that, that are central to the book is uh, Rousseau, the French thinker, a uh, figure from the provinces uh, revolting against the ways of the metropolitan elite in Paris, 
and whose ideas find a kind of global audience, first in Germany, then as far as you know, people in, 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 in Iran and, 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 and further afield. So I, Rousseau is this figure you know, offering a kind of romantic um, reaction against people who have it all, who are in privileged positions. So I had been taking notes for, 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 for a book on what I thought would be uh, an experience that binds together many different nations, Germany, Italy, Russia, Turkey, India, China. And what is this experience? Is this experience of arriving late in the race for development and modernity? Is the experience of realizing that some people have already got ahead of you and you are, now have to enter a race for wealth and power. So this book really in many ways is um, a product of an effort to write a history, an emotional history of uneven development of people who feel they have been left behind, they want to catch up, and the kind of emotional states, and of course, ideas that they arrive at in the process of trying to catch up with the people who have already made it, in this case, uh, Western Europe, and to a uh, lesser extent, the, 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 uh, the, the United States. Because you know, it's very clear that early revolutions, political, economic, technological, scientific, had privileged certain countries, Britain, France, and then the United States, in the race for national wealth and power. And they had also forced the rest, uh, many of those countries that they occupied and colonized, uh, they had forced those countries into a reaction um, that was ambivalent at best and very, very confused at worst. So you had, I'm sure you'll recognize these emotions, you had, you have a kind of loathing of this imperial hierarchy of nations and peoples of people who are at the very top or nations who are at the very top. You have the resentment of their cultural and economic superiority, but you also enviously desire to steal the secrets of their wealth and their power and to replace them. You want to replace them eventually. In country after country from 19th century Prussia to post-colonial India, this was you know, how you entered history with these kinds of very contradictory emotions. And of course, you know, there was this is at the level of emotions, then there was this other thing that was going on, which was ideological mobilization by new nation states, construction of a nationality or people, a cohesive people. You had the centralization of the state's powers, you know, rapid fire industrialization, militarization in many cases, and you know, many, many uh, shortcuts. Uh, China's you know, great leap forward, uh, many, many disasters in the process of catching up this, this effort not to be left behind. Of course, this universal race, large-scale mobilization and international competition was not what the ideology of progress that was offered by uh, Western Europe and America, this is not what that ideology had ever envisaged. It had actually seen, predicted a much more benign outcome to the global spread of individual reason and, 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 and commerce. Um, and you know, likewise, people who were talking about globalization and how wonderful it is in the last 20, 30 years, um, encouraging human beings to think of themselves as entrepreneurs belonging to the marketplace, they were also you know, off offering a, a very positive end to history. And this very naive vision of um, enlightened universalism 
was hegemonic in the last uh, two, three decades. And I think you know, in many ways, uh, this is the period that we are now really coming in, coming, coming, coming to uh, an end uh, where a time where people in the West were prescribing how Muslim nations should become modern, modern how they, these backward societies should progress. Now what we're seeing is a kind of political, economic, cultural, social breakdown in the very heart of countries that had set themselves up as models for the rest of the world to, to, to follow. So while I was writing Age of Anger, you know, 2014 onwards to 2016, it became clear that all the pathologies that the left behind or the belated nations suffered, uh, the sort of remorseless logic of uneven development had not only shaped our experiences, our trajectories, the so-called, the trajectories of the so-called latecomers to modernity, and you know, uh, this, this process that also generated various ideologies um, of you know, Nazism being one of them, or Italian fascism, or Japanese militarism. The fact, the, the extraordinary fact was that those pathologies had started to erupt in the heart of the so-called developed West. Why? Because, largely because of China turning the economic tables um, and you know, creating thereby devastating political consequences in different parts of Western Europe uh, and America. So many, many people had started to make the very, very nasty discovery that liberal democracy, liberal capitalism, which was supposedly normal political and economic ideologies and structures, had actually very, very cruelly betrayed the promise of freedom and prosperity. So in, in, in uh, many ways, I think this process, this experience of falling behind, of feeling left behind, of being feeling scorned, marginalized by liberal elites, has gone in a way truly universal, in a way that even I did not really anticipate um, and had to you know, catch up as I was writing the, uh, this, 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 this particular book. And now with the pandemic, of course, I think we are recognizing, uh, all of us, that a particular history of the world and a particular historical consciousness we all had that we have to reach this particular stage that other countries have reached in the past. In many ways, this was overproducing the future. This was over anticipating the future. The future is not going to be that. It's not very clear. Um, and modernity has entered a kind of end game. Um, I think I can say that now without sounding uh, extreme or, or without lapsing into exaggeration. People are looking to completely you know, uh, to, to, to ideologies and ideas that was completely taboo for a long time, such as socialism in the United States. Um, you know, it has had an extraordinary resurgence, especially among young people uh, who are very angry at the older generation and are um, embracing socialist ideas with a, with a passion we've never seen before in the United States where socialism was completely, completely uh, stigmatized, especially uh, during the Cold War. Um, I think for many of us who lived in countries, um, and I speak from the Indian experience, where socialism was also a great slogan and an ideology, I think uh, this, this appeal of socialism in America reminds us of the scale of socialism's defeat in the past but it also reminds us just how inadequate socialism in the past was and how simplistic and hubristic the faith socialists had in human mastery over nature and also what a simple idea socialism had of human desires and motivations. And also, you know, when people talk today about um, socialism in Britain and the United States, 
and they speak about solidarity, uh, class solidarity, I think um, you cannot but see that actually the class solidarity they are speaking about may have become impossible because the classes themselves in their old form have disappeared more or less. In, uh, in India, for instance, it will be very hard to find any, any, any sort of class solidarity. I mean, what has happened is the experience of blocked social mobility you know, on top of very poor private education and state education have created conditions not for class solidarity or class struggle, but a kind of mass exodus into the smartphone screen where you see Mr. Modi, Bollywood stars, social media influencers, they're offering endless possibilities of consumption and self-expansion, you know, even, 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 even virtually. So what I'm trying to say is that too many conventional ideas about political action, uh, where do we go from here, have been eroded by the advance of markets, technologies, into the most intimate spheres of our lives. So even the most sensitive, intelligent people have become very accustomed to living or, or, or in a society that they consider a kind of marketplace where they are in competition with other people. And the experience leaves them struggling with envy, resentment, and fear, leaves them existentially and spiritually at each other's throats. In, in many ways, the permanent state of warfare that you see on Twitter reflects a, a, a broader pathology. My, I mean, book ends on a slightly vague note, which is that, you know, we should have some truly transformative thinking about both the self and the world. And it seems too utopian. Um, I th it certainly seemed very utopian when the book came out in 2017. I, I do think that the pandemic has shown very clearly that it wasn't actually utopian and that many of our habits of thought, of feeling, our assumptions, our self-perceptions will have to be radically altered if the world is to remain inhabitable for future generations. I mean, in one sense, it is right that the far-right demagogues who are in power should be defeated and, you know, to that end, most of our political energies should be directed. But at the same time, I think we should remember that the moral and intellectual choices that we face today are much, much wider than those that we are going to exercise when we vote or when we seek political victory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pankaj, for this great introduction, uh, which also I think is a great starting point for our discussion because you explained very succinctly where the idea for the age of anger came from and, and what, the main, what the book's main argument is. Sorry. Yes, okay. 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 Right. <laughs> um, i just like to start with a question on the book. Now, um, the book talks about a certain state in which individuals are currently in a certain state that is defined at the individual level by increasing disillusionment, disappointment, and high rates of anxiety, and what you could refer to as existential anxiety. Now, of course, the book came out in 2017, so it's been almost three years now uh, since it's been published, and quite a lot also happened in these three years, right? I mean, we've re most recently experienced a health crisis, 
on top of the political, economic, and the social crises which you point, point out in the book, which is also a global crisis on its own, and which also is a crisis that has the potential to increase the alienation of the individual under lockdowns or the loosening further of social bonds uh, that, that, that keep them together, that keep societies together, and that keep individuals grounded. Now, that's perhaps a more pessimistic sort of development or, or state on human emotions, as you'd also yourself highlight uh, brilliantly. Now, on the other hand, we've also had reactions to these kind of populist or authoritarian or anti-democratic movements, which you also elaborate both in the Age of Anger but in your other works as well. We've had mass movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance. We've had the toppling of statutes of slave owners, you know, in, in places like Britain or, or Belgium. Uh, we've had, because you talk about the crisis of masculinity, for instance, right? And we've had the Me Too movement as a kind of a reaction to this prevailing misogyny of our times. So this too is happening at the very same time. Mm -hmm. So against this background, I'm just wondering how you evaluate the concept of the age of anger and how it, uh, in a way, evolved or can evolve in, these, in, the, in the background of these last three years' developments. Absolutely. Well, I think age of anger is premised on the notion that democracy as an idea, by, by democracy I mean uh, the promise of equality and dignity to individuals. So that ideal is now truly universal. Everyone seeks it, everyone wants it. Even the demagogues, if you notice, they talk about democracy. Mm. Uh, that's really important. They're not saying I'm bringing you fascism, they're saying I'm bringing you real democracy. And that seductive idea has been embraced by more and more people. One reason, as I tried to explain in the book, is that so much that is happening today is happening globally simultaneously is because of this global export, very successful export of the idea of democracy. So in societies where caste and class were very important once upon a time, hierarchical societies where people supposedly knew their place, didn't challenge their superiors, uh, did not want to break out of their traditional ancestral uh, vocations, livelihoods. All that has really kind of, you know, crumbled uh, and very rapidly in the last 20, 30 years. I've seen this up close in, 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 in India, a very hierarchical society, rigidly so, and we've experienced a kind of democratic revolution where everyone feels they're entitled to being treated with respect, equality, dignity, and then on top of that, and I think this is a new element in the last 20, 30 years, they also want prosperity. Like prosperity is the new source of self-esteem for millions, tens of millions of people. And this is, I think, a radical development. You know, this was, this is especially in, 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 in a very popular societies like, like, uh, like India, where um, previous ways of life or worldviews emphasized austerity, frugality, uh, self-denial even. And this notion of expansion, of growth, of accumulation, of acquisitiveness, these are all still very new ideas, but they have been embraced and they become very seductive. So you want prosperity, you want to be recognized as an individual with rights, with dignity, with respect, but what are the means available to you for achieving those? achieving those goals. And so the age of anger results when there's a growing gap between rising expectations, people actually emerging from rural backgrounds or semi-rural, semi-urban backgrounds, aspiring for more, and then finding that the way is blocked. Um, and at the same time, you have a dysfunctional economy. And that's what creates a perfect storm that we are in right now. Now, what has happened since the book came out um, is that I think the idea that prosperity can be achieved easily, that's been shelved. Mm. I think that was already being shelved uh, before Trump came to power because it had become very clear, I think with the financial crisis onwards, that prosperity has actually really only gone to a small number of people and that it has become more and more difficult for other people to make it, for most people to make it. And that trickle down is not gonna happen, redistribution is not definitely not happening. 
and that globalization is going to generate more and more inequality. So the conversation started to shift, I think, under Trump in particular. I mean, mm. Trump made that very clear. He kind of created a sense of blockage mm. that now we are in this hell. Um, and I think in many ways, BLM, and I mean, BLM also, you know, you remember it had an early career which was not so successful. Mm. It didn't really take off for many years. Uh, in fact, ironically, uh, in, in May this year, The Economist had a piece saying, why did BLM fail? The next month it exploded. Mm. Um, and I think it exploded because of the special conditions of the pandemic, which made people, you know, in one place and, 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 and people were already so fed up with everything that was happening at the time. Um, so this notion that actually the system is rigged and has been rigged for a long time, which I think also uh, went a lot into the Me Too movement mm. and that people have put up with too much for far too long. Mm. In a way, Trump was a catalyst for that. Uh, you felt frustrated. There was nothing you could do about it. There was this man in the White House openly boasting about, you know, uh, 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 abusing women. Uh, uh, I mean, every kind of atrocity you can imagine that man had openly boasted about. But there was nothing he could do. There he was. You, you know, there was a massive women's march soon after he came to came to came to power in 2017. And then, you know, as like most things, those those kinds of energies cannot be sustained over long. But then finally there was this catalyst, another catalyst, and the Me Too movement took off. The black BLM took off at, at the same time. And I think um, behind them really was this demand for dignity, for respect. It's like, you cannot go on like this anymore. Um, okay, we are not going to, we are not asking for, you know, uh, prosperity or pro for all at this point, but we're asking for a basic recognition of our dignity as human beings. And I think in many ways also the historical awareness that was previously confined to the margins, especially in the United States, the notion that the United States really grew out of or acquired its wealth and power through slavery, exploitation, you know, other forms of coercion uh, and exploitative practices, that was, you know, something only a few people on the left were talking about all these years. And then over time, it has become, you know, very, very deeply entrenched within the American consciousness, and especially among young people. I think young people are growing up with this awareness that the world is a very unfair place, and they're asking questions, what made it such an unfair place? And so with this basic historic, historical consciousness, they're suddenly ex discovering new facts that, oh, this man whose statue we passed every day for many, many years is actually the statue of a slave owner. And that sparks a kind of outrage, I think, mm -hmm. you know. So your first awareness to the world and how it is constituted, how it came to be, is through this awareness of a historical crime, of historical atrocity. And I think that has really, you know, in, again, I think it's the same democratic revolution at work there, except that it's not yet found a proper outlet. That is the problem. Mm -hmm. And you know, Biden's victory in November is not going to change things that much. Yeah, in terms of the overall structure, yeah, in terms of the transformative impact that you talk about in your books. Okay, I'm just going to ask another question, but I'll also like to remind, especially those of you who are joining us virtually, that you can ask your questions, uh, and we are going to have a brief Q&A session at the very end. So let me just remind that as well. And I've got an iPad where I can see all the questions and I can just cluster them and ask them to you. But before that, since we are also here um, at the opening of the official launch of the semester at the university, I'm also uh, genuinely curious uh, about your views on public intellectuals and the role of public intellectuals here and the university here. Like, where does it stand? Because I know that you do take issue with a lot of sort of public thinkers, intellectual, both historically, you know, from Voltaire to Rousseau, etc., but also with contemporary intellectuals and academics as well. So I'd just like to hear very briefly your, your comments on that as well. And then perhaps from there onwards, we can move on to the Q&A if there are any questions from the floor and also from the virtual audience. I think, I mean, the public intellectual for me is an ambiguous figure. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, when somebody is declared a public intellectual, I'm immediately suspicious of that figure. Mm. Because uh, in most cases, that person will be amplifying what, in many ways, the establishment mm -hmm. wants to be amplified. And this is how they've acquired that position in the first place. You know, this is how they've 
become public intellectual in the first places because they have a lot of power behind them, the networks of institutions, of think tanks, of universities. And those are not designed, those institutions, those networks are not designed to host dissenting voices. They are designed to host intellectuals, voices that can offer justifications for what those institutions are doing. So the public intellectual finds um, himself or herself obliged to essentially articulate what other people have already said, maybe add a little bit more to it, but be in this re really s this this occupy this space where supposedly thought is meant to happen, mm. but thought is actually not happening there. Thinking is not actually happening there. What you think looking at is recycling. Um, so I feel like we need to question this notion a lot more. Mm. And I think we need to think again about the notion of the free thinker, mm. uh, uh, that the unaffiliated thinker, the thinker who's not necessarily part of a particular network, uh, who's not beholden to a think tank or you know particular way of thinking about progress or development or any number of things or American foreign policy for that matter. Mm. I mean, you have any number of American public intellectuals who speak on American foreign policy, they all speak th with the same voice. Mm. And the moment there is a challenge to them, they all pounce on that figure. You know, you, you just have to speak about having a different policy for Israel in America to know that you will be completely marginalized uh, and, 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 and isolated. So I feel like the public intellectual has not performed the role he or she should have performed. Mm -hmm. And that uh, public intellectual has really become a kind of intellectual accessory to uh, the powers that be, to the, mm -hmm. to the people who are already in, in, in power. So in my own writing, I've kind of tried to question that mm -hmm. notion of the, of the public intellectual mm -hmm. and, you know, starting with Voltaire. I mean, there is, a, there is a particular tradition of giving advice to power and, you know, uh, it's not a dishonorable tradition uh, completely, but I do think the possibility of corruption, the possibility of intellectual compromise is much, much greater the closer proximity you have to power. Mm -hmm. The good thing about, uh, I can say about India, maybe about Turkey as well, that the intellectual is, is such a marginal figure. Mm -hmm. The intellectual is not really so much in demand by the establishment, mm -hmm. by the politicians. Uh, they can very well dispense with 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 intellectuals, so willy nilly, the intellectual finds himself or herself in a kind of contrarian and and, and and questioning role because they are you know forced to be on the margins. They're not really invited into the circles of power so much. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, you mentioned free thought, and that of course is automatically related to the right to free speech as well, right? Mm -hmm. So the two go together. Now, there's already, I was already going to ask you that if I had the time, but I'm happy to see that others have asked a question on the Q&A, um, in the Q&A section on this as well, about, you know, access to free speech in the age of prevalence of social media and also post-truth. What does free speech mean anymore? And do we really have access to it? Well, I think the free speech and the speech in general becomes a problematic issue when you have so much free speech. Um, and I think, you know, I completely disagree with people who complain about free speech being curtailed. In many ways, speech has never been freer because you have so many different platforms that you can occupy and from where you can uh, ventilate your thoughts, your ideas, whether they are fully formed or raw or whatever form they are. Um, and, you know, this is in many ways part of the crisis we are in, that we have far too much free speech and it amounts to a kind of cacophony mm. of voices. And it's very hard for someone, especially young people, to figure out uh, what is interesting, what is wise and what is dangerous and what is toxic. So I think we've kind of moved on from these old debates about free speech, mm. um, where you had you know relatively s simple scenario where someone was oppressing or someone was strangling free speech it was either a powerful state or a non-state actor i think 
you know, in, 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 in most contexts, I mean, even in China, which is, you know, uh, very resourceful uh, in, 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 repress, in repressing free speech, you have many instances of people speaking out and actually surviving. You know, I, I know personally uh, a, a Tibetan poet who writes the most, you know, bold and provocative uh, things on a blog and, you know, every time she's allowed to go on social media, she does that. So, you know, there are, there are these openings that have been created by digital media where it mm. is actually possible to say what you want to say. Mm. I think the, a lot of the anxiety about free speech comes from people who've never been previously challenged before. And, um, I mean, for instance, that letter that appeared in Harper's uh, magazine in the US, mm. uh, signed by various very prominent and very famous people, and you look at their profiles and you wonder in what way have their free speech been curtailed? You know, you're occupying positions, multiple positions, Harvard, Princeton, you're writing for the New York Times, you're writing for every newspaper, and you can write for every, any newspaper you want to. I don't see how your free speech has been curtailed. What has changed, definitely, that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they could write anything they want, and there was no, no challenge whatsoever, because people didn't really have those voices that they now have. And so when you get challenged, you now start complaining that your free speech is being curtailed. I think it's actually really falsifying um, this, 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 this particular situation you find yourself in. I think it's really very simple that you are being challenged for the first time in your life. Yes, I mean, I guess it also depends a lot on the national context within which you're talking about. I mean, the discussion on free speech is also, I think, also largely contingent on the context within which we're talking Absolutely. about, right? Yeah. Um, okay, I have an interesting uh, question here, which on the Arab Spring, uh, that somebody has asked whether or not the Arab Spring movements, although they did ultimately fail in most of the cases, whether they were also a consequence of this new movement of pursuing prosperity that you've just mentioned in your um, in your introduction. Well, I think you know. I mean, the, let's. Uh, there are different ways of approaching that question. Um, I feel like we make too much of the failure of the Arab Spring, and 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 the the failure of uh, autocracies to be entirely eradicated. When we think about the revolutions of the past, I mean, just think about the French Revolution. How long did it take for the ideals and values of the French Revolution to be institutionalized? You know, you had decades and decades of reaction of despots, of authoritarian mm -hmm. figures in France. I mean, you know, it takes a long time for revolutions to succeed. And even though you're not quite clear what you know, the, the eventual outcome will be, um, the French, the Arab Spring, you know, again, it was a sort of, it was an explosion of long bottled up frustrations and resentments you know, of autocrats, of you know, dysfunctional economies, extreme corruption, um, you know, food riots preceding the Arab Spring in, 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 in many cases. You know, climate change is a huge, huge factor there. So I don't you know, really know whether um, the promise of prosperity so much was involved there, but there was definitely, I mean, I think the Arab Spring definitely was a product of the democratic revolution that I was talking about earlier, where you know suddenly people who had not challenged their autocratic leaders for a very long time suddenly felt empowered to do that. Mm -hmm. And you know that was a consequence of this you know globalized world that we're living in. You're exposed to images of other people enjoying the good life, other people enjoying freedoms that you don't have, and then you start to ask yourself, why don't you have those? And you feel energized enough to go out onto the you know Terry Square and to, mm -hmm. to, to demonstrate. So in that sense, the politics of resentment also, it can take both positive and negative forms, right? As, Absolutely. as we've been also discussing all along. Yeah. Uh, now I'm an IR scholar, so of, of a scholar of international relations, and so I will, uh, I feel the urge to ask you this. Now obviously in my field, there is this new call for global IR, and I know that you're going to talk much more about these in tomorrow's webinar, um, but there is also uh, this idea that we've faced the end, that we're facing the end of the so-called liberal international order and I know that you've also been taking a very historical outlook on this question you know taking it the argument that in fact this whole thing has been unraveling since uh, since the 19th century how do you see this evolving and uh, in terms of you know would you call this the end of the liberal international order or what kind of an order do you think we're looking at at the global level 
Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about the internet, liberal international order was that, um, as someone put it, it was neither liberal nor international nor much of an order. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a, it was a, you know, intellectual construct which was extremely helpful to the American establishment, to the State Department, the Pentagon. Then you had, you know, all these intellectual laborers in think tanks and university departments, and you know, it was a. It was an interesting fiction, you know, that allowed a kind of coherent policy uh, making, even, you know, in the face of disasters and calamities, you still held on to this notion that there is a liberal international order, America is the enforcer of it with its, you know, military bases and the rules and, and regulations that it draws up through its, through the institutions it dominates, whether the World Bank or the IMF, and, you know, this is how the world works, um, obviously, you know, the world had been changing all this time, and I think decolonization, uh, the Americans really missed that mm -hmm. whole process. And one reason why they're completely dumbfounded by the rise of China in the last 20 years, because they didn't realize that decolonization had started and was unstoppable. You were never gonna be able to militarily occupy and colonize those countries, and those countries will, at some point, fight their way to sovereignty and to national power and wealth. So China was all along coming, you know, rising to essentially blast open this liberal international order. And, you know, the reason why we didn't really fail to see it coming is because we were trapped too much into those, you know, conceptual mm -hmm. uh, bubbles of the liberal mm -hmm. international order. I think we have some questions from the floor as well. So before we finish, I'd like to get uh, collect them if possible. Uh, Fuatojem, I've seen your hand. I think there's a microphone over there. So if somebody could help with that. Oh. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much for the enlightening uh, speech and the uh, Q&A. Uh, One of your uh, commentaries, uh, you were suggesting that uh, we need new ideas rather than new faces. What are those ideas that would shape our way of looking at today's world and a better, making the world better and fair and just? So what kind of ideas that we could actually talk about? And the secondly, uh, you know, we are here uh, together to have you to give a speech for our university's new academic year. We have new students who are not able to come to university. We are doing all of these things online. And when we look at the youth, and look at the surveys on the youth, on the one hand, uh, they are weary about future. They are pessimistic about future. They are afraid about uncertainties, risk, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, we have to give them some direction that uh, it would be, you know, there would be a better way of looking at future today and tomorrow rather than resentment and, and fears. They are kind of squeezed between uncertainty and fear, despair and resentment. But what would be your suggestion to young people in terms of how to uh, deal with this very, very difficult times and uncertainty. Maybe these two together, new ideas and uh, how to deal with today and tomorrow, especially from the angle of the youth. I, you know, derive most of the hope and optimism I feel today from young people, to be very honest. Um, I feel that this is a generation, uh, people even in the early teens uh, and right up to people in their mid twenties and late twenties, this is a generation that has experienced unprecedented politicization and a historical awareness of a sophistication that previous generations did not have. So this is already a huge advance over what previous generations have experienced and thought about. They're already thinking thoughts that it took a long time for previous generations to arrive at. Some of them have still not arrived at those thoughts. Mm. Radical thoughts about how to shape the world, what kind of economies we need, what kind of politics we need. We, I can speak for my generation, and I know there's an older generation too, we were too overawed, we were too impressed by what we saw as a success 
of the establishment of previous political systems or economic systems. We were too sometimes intimidated by them to openly question them or challenge them. Young people have broken free from that paradigm, from those you know, modes of intimidation. Uh, they are, you know, I think, the more I see them, the more I talk to them, the more I realize that actually this is where hope lies today, that they are free to think thoughts that we were not free. And, and you know, I think it would be very presumptuous of me as a member of an older generation to start prescribing ideas to them at this point because they are experiencing a present which is very uncertain, a future which is very ambiguous at this point. Uh, who knows what the future will bring? So they already have more experience in a very short span that, than I really had. Um, so in a way, they are much advanced of me at this point. So I feel like ideas will emerge from an actual experience of the world, from an engagement with the world, both political and intellectual. You know, give you an example. I think the, the, the most important idea that has emerged in the West in the last few years since Trump came to power is the work of someone who's still in her 20s, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. First time Congresswoman, who has already defined an agenda, New Green Deal, which is something that has been widely embraced by young people, old people. It has been intellectually debated, discussed. It has become, it has emerged out of nowhere and now it's on everyone's lips. Now, this is what I call engagement by a young person, a radicalized young person, a politicized young person who comes from a particular background, is experiencing, you know, everything that people around the world are experiencing because of her background, because of her constituency where she, where she has an electoral base. So I feel like this is where really we should derive, der derive hope from right now, that young people engaging with their world will throw up ideas that completely break from everything that has gone in the past. Okay. We have any other questions from the floor? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my question would be um, a little bit about leadership and about great powers. Um, uh, certainly uh, in today's world, which is a very difficult uh, place, um, which uh, is full of uncertainties and uh, where we see a lack um, of, of real, of true leadership, uh, since the United States uh, is in a situation currently where it's involved into an internal struggle and uh, reflecting more uncertainty um, and more kind of uh, struggle and dividedness as, 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 uh, as, as before. And you mentioned China as a rising power, who certainly is uh, uh, is, is having its right um, and is on the course of, a, um, of an economic um, rise, of an eco economic leadership, but at the same time um, taking advantage of a vacuum of power and vacuum of, uh, I would say, of, um, uh, of, of values that, um, of so-called Western values where you ask yourself sometimes where um, have they gone, have they disappeared or not. And uh, so in order for, for somebody or for people to, to, to really live freedom and to, to make their voices heard, um, where do you see the need of, um, or do you see the need of leadership of somebody who ensures um, the space um, or the platform where people can make their voices heard? Uh, since uh, you have these, um, um, a rising power, a kind of power in decline, uh, Europe somewhere in between, India somewhere in between, you know, the weakening power of multilateralism. So you have a, a, a very, very strange situation at the moment where um, the, uh, the platform, um, the certainty of values uh, is um, kind of fading a little bit. And uh, how do you see the situation how can we restore um, a, um, a platform where on the basis of the guarantee of values, guarantee of free of speech, 
um, real multilateralism, real kind of free internet, um, intellectuals, politicians, etc., can struggle for the truth and for a better world? Well, I wouldn't say rest you know, restoring um, any of that world would be a correct characterization of the world that we've just lived through because I think, you know, some of those values were indeed available to some people in, in the West, but even in the United States, uh, they were not widely available, no, certainly not to the minorities, otherwise you would not have BLM or you would not have Me Too. Um, human dignity was still being trampled upon in these, um, in these societies. So I think uh, the invocation of Western values was important and essential, but I think uh, it was clear even back then that those values were only partially honored, even in the West itself. Uh, now, of course, we have a situation where those values are being violated on a, on a, on a daily basis. Um, but I think that should lead us to question why those values are so fragile. Uh, what is it about our political systems and economic systems that only certain people can enjoy them at a particular time? And why uh, only some people have enjoyed them post-45? Pre-45, hardly anyone really you know, could claim to have enjoyed them over a long period. Um, you had two world wars, you had various you know, other economic crises. Uh, 19th century was not a happy period for many, many people who were colonized and, and, and occupied. It's only after 45, with Europe rebuilding itself, post-colonial nations starting on a project of national modernization, there was some respite, some peace, some pursuit, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, of these ideals that you spoke about. That period has again come to an end, and I feel like instead of thinking about a restoration, because there's no way we can go back to that period, we should you know, direct our energies to you know, this question, like why is it that these values prove so, trans, uh, uh, to, so, 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 so fragile and so impermanent? Uh, what is it that we need to do to ensure that more and more people benefit from that? I think you know, leadership in that case by, of one country or another is not going to solve that problem because you know, American leadership was again a kind of convenient fiction that at some point we all subscribe to, uh, to varying degrees. And that fiction has now completely collapsed. You know, George W. Bush was not a leader anyone could look to. Ronald Reagan was not a leader when you think about it. He might have been s proclaimed himself to be the leader of the free world, but you know, I mean, what we know about Reagan does not encourage uh, really him to think of someone that other people should be aspiring to. Uh, so I feel like those fictions have collapsed and there's no really, no great point in piecing together those fictions again. We have to move on, we have to think about, you know, this, this, this new world that we are entering. And again, that sort of question like, why have the so-called achievements of the West in the post-45 period, whether it's democracy, uh, social welfare systems, and these are these were genuine achievements. Why have they proven to be so fragile and and, and so easily destroyed? Yes. Very final question, David, because <laughs> we have to finish. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, that was a really interesting talk, um, uh, which I really enjoyed listening to. And we've already mentioned it's the beginning of the academic year, and we also mentioned some sort of social um, sort of big movements. Uh, and I would include the Fridays for Future movement, which is um, the environmental movement. And I'm just wondering about the role of um, academic scholars um, in social movements. Um, so as someone researching climate change issues, um, would you recommend me on a Friday when I get up in the morning to go into my institute and continue my research on climate change? or to go onto the streets and protest with the environmental movement? Both, maybe. Um, <laughs> there needn't be a choice between the two. I mean, I feel like, you know, I think, um, I mean, this is what I suppose the events of the last few years have done, is kind of dissolve these uh, somewhat artificial boundaries between thinking and, and, and activism, in that we are now empowered to, to do a whole lot of things that we previously even weren't thinking of. Uh, in great detail. I mean, you know, the Extinction Rebellion, um, the climate change protests, the big protests in, that we've seen around the world, they weren't really happening four or five years ago. So 
now you know they're happening large numbers of people are showing up and it's now backed by scholarship it's backed by again the kind of scholarship we didn't really see i mean the stern report i think was the first kind of you know popular at least something that really settled in the in 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 mainstream opinion so i feel like they need, they, they need to be complementary um you know scholars um need to have a much more activist orientation i mean in that sense i think climate change or scholarship on climate change um has really in a way been the most important intellectual contribution of the last 10 years because what is really done is punctured a big hole in the old ideology and paradigm that we were all working with previously which was that progress is potentially endless economic growth faster economic growth higher economic growth the better all these you know assumptions and ideas we've been living with have really been brought down to earth by climate change scholarship so in a way it's the most radical and most you know dissenting uh intellectual work that has happened um and i feel like it has to have an activist orientation because it's up against it it's up against the dominant powerful ideologies and establishments of our times well pankaj thank you very much for this and for your excellent speech and the q and a as well uh it was a privilege and an honor to to speak with you and 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 to also chair the session but i'd have to close now because we have run out of time or we need to move on with the next session so thank you so much thank you thank you We extend our sincere thanks to Pankaj Mishra and Senam Aydın Düzgit. We wish that this 2020-21 academic year will be fruitful for our students, faculty members, and our staff of Sabancı University, and also for our new fellows of 2020-21 Mercator IPC Fellowship Program, which is a part of Istanbul Policy Center, Sabancı University, and Stiftung Mercator Initiative. We have great hopes and excitement for this new beginning. The initiative has created a synergy between German, Turkish, and overall European research communities through Mercator IPC Fellowship Program. The past nine years have undoubtedly strengthened our communities, and it's our strong alumni network that has largely contributed to the success. Today, we are gathered also to welcome seven new members to our family. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you this year's fellows. Then we will watch a short movie about their projects and future research. EU German Turkish relations category. Elena Duk. International Educational Cooperation, a corner store of sustainable foreign policy. Jan Şirkok. Promoting civic participation in EU Turkish municipal cooperation. Karolina Agustova. Violent impacts of EU's externalization politics on refugees' everyday mobility in Turkey. Michael Keating. Turkey's, Turkey's enhanced engagement with EU agencies, a potential membership substitute mechanism in a differentiated EU. Climate change category. Ahmet Atıl Aşıcı. The Green New Deal for Turkey to tackle the climate crisis. David Samuel Williams. How national adaptation plans can address and consider vulnerable communities. Özge Geik. Climate change and nutritional sustainability. Aligning climate change, food production, and public health in nutrition targets. Please enjoy a short movie on their projects. Hi, 
my name is David Samuel Williams. My background is in geography and political science, and for the past five years, I've been working on climate change adaptation. The most recent research has shown that climate change adaptation is oriented towards those who already have sufficient resources to adapt, as opposed to those most in need of adaptation. There are very few methods and approaches for including vulnerable communities in adaptation plans, both at the local municipal level and at the national governmental level. As a MacArthur IPC Fellow, I will explore and assess current approaches to climate change adaptation through the lens of the UNFCCC National Adaptation Plans and how these consider and address vulnerable communities in Istanbul. In addition, I aim to identify and develop processes for enhancing the consideration of vulnerable communities in climate change adaptation practice suitable for formulating national adaptation plans. Hey, my name is Michael, Michael Keating. I'm a political scientist contributing to the scholarly and practitioner's debate on the future of Europe. EU agencies have stood for solutions to European problems and as promoters for European integration. There are currently 48 agencies located in 27 member states. A mostly neglected feature of EU agencies is the growing importance and involvement of third countries in EU agencies as a form of external differentiation of European integration. Currently, Turkey participates in only two out of 34 powerful regulatory EU agencies, the Environmental Agency and the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drugs Addiction. As a MacArthur IPC Fellow, I will carry out research specifically on Turkey's engagement in these agencies and examine which policy areas and under which conditions Turkey could engage in the future. Hi, my name is Elena Dirk. I'm a political scientist focused on foreign policy analysis and theory development. The recent pandemic clearly showed that no country can solve today's problems alone. Thus, foreign policy must foster cooperation and understanding between countries and reduce global hierarchies. One area in which this can be taught is educational cooperation, such as schools abroad or joint universities. Educational cooperation is an important tool for sustainable foreign policy, meaning a foreign policy that is long-term oriented rather than problem-driven. As a MacArthur IPC Fellow, I will explore the potentials and limitations of these institutions and their impact as tools for a more sustainable foreign policy. Hi, my name is Karolina Augustova and my research lies at the nexus of sociology and international relations. It examines migration, violence, and the EU's external border management. Transit migration and its intersections with violence have been increasingly observed along the EU's internal and external borders, stretching from southeastern Europe to Turkey. Refugee experiences of violence range from state withdrawal of aid to direct and brutal attacks at borders. These have significant impact on refugees' daily decisions, routines and relations. Thus, the impact of violence on everyday life should be studied alongside with the EU's external border management. However, this topic remains understudied. As a Mercator IPC Fellow, I will explore refugees' everyday experiences of violence in Turkey while considering the EU-Turkey negotiations from the perspectives of NGO and political elites. Hi, I am Ahmed Azalashiji. I am an economist working at the nexus of economic growth and sustainability. 
Climate change is felt in all spheres. Today, as countries face additional economic problems and workers struggle to sustain their livelihoods, urgent transformation is a must. We need to find a way to simultaneously address economic, social and ecological problems. The EU's 2019 European Green Deal might be an effective, ambitious tool toward this end. While aiming to turn Europe into the first climate-neutral continent by 2050, the European Green Deal will have economic impacts on the Turkish economy as well. As a Mercator IPC Fellow, I will carry out research on how the EU's European Green Deal will affect the Turkish economy and how Turkey can transform itself in order to face these multidimensional challenges. I'm a sustainability scientist focusing on food system sustainability. Around the world, we have been observing unsustainable patterns in the global food systems that have resulted in an exponential increase in the number of overweight citizens despite persistent hunger and micronutrient deficiencies. Along with increasing agricultural production, greenhouse gas emissions are also on the rise. Turkey, like many other countries, faces multifaceted challenges and needs an interdisciplinary approach to achieve nutritional sustainability. As a market or IPC fellow, I will assess options for nutrition sensitive and sustainable food systems in Turkey. With an interdisciplinary approach combining climate science, agronomics, and public health nutrition, my research project will create new knowledge on nutritional sustainability. Hi, my name is Jan Skriakov. I am an educator and a social entrepreneur focusing on building international and transcultural bridges. Top-level relations between Turkey and the EU are increasingly strained. High hopes of convergence and even Turkey's EU accession have long given way to disappointments, to merely transactional approaches and even to outright antagonism. An honest reversal of this trend will neither be fast nor always pleasant, but deep personal links, both old and new, can be a bottom-up economic, social and above all an emotional force to help see us through. For that, we need many more people to get to know each other and to actively shape our relations. As a Mercator IPC Fellow, I want to learn more about how municipalities and their international partnerships can enable and support such participation. Özellikle gençlere, sivil toplum örgütlerine, belediyelere, yerel ve uluslararası kurumlara seslenmek istiyorum. Schauen wir alle gemeinsam, was wir voneinander lernen können. Ich freue mich darauf. We extend our heartfelt welcome to the new Mercator IPC Fellows. We have high hopes that the fruits of your work will continue to strengthen our initiative and build a brighter future for Turkey, Germany, EU relations and climate change, as well as economic community at large. Once again, thank you for joining us online and in person tonight. Thank you.